Good evening, I'm Andrew Chen. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a political fight from a social distance for the future of a country sick with COVID. The American people have had to sacrifice far too much because of the incompetence of this administration. It is Kamala Harris and Mike Pence throw down in a vice presidential debate like no other. The fact that you continue to undermine public confidence in a vaccine. The tone was civil, but make no mistake, the battle was real. With so much at stake, what will Americans think of the choice before them? Also tonight. Uh, this is definitely a wake-up call. Outbreaks at long-term care homes in Moncton and Ottawa. Are we making the same mistakes over again? And a hockey dream come true with a little history on the side. I all have to say is I'm just very excited. Quinton Byfield shatters an ice ceiling. This is The National. Tonight, a political showdown south of the border, the only vice presidential debate of the U.S. election. Now, any other year, that's not always a lean-in moment, but this obviously isn't any other year. And what has happened in that country over the last week has pushed the job of vice president into the spotlight. So not only is the country dealing with a crisis, a pandemic that has killed more than 211,000 people, but the president himself is sick. So tonight, the gap between the two sides was physical as well as political. We've got all you need to know covering the debate and the reaction to it tonight. We have Susan Ormiston in Washington and Stephen D'Souza in New York. So this debate was focused on issues and so different from last week's chaotic presidential face-off. The pandemic played big, but it really wasn't the only topic. And before we dive into the analysis, a taste of what was said. That from the very first day, President Donald Trump has put the health of America first. Whatever the vice president is claiming the administration has done, clearly it hasn't worked. President Trump and I trust the American people to make choices in the best interest of their health. We're about freedom and respecting the freedom of the American people. This administration stood on information that if you had as a parent, if you had as a worker knowing you didn't have enough money saved up and now you're standing in a food line because of the ineptitude of an administration that was unwilling to speak the truth to the American people. If the Trump administration approves a vaccine before or after the election, should Americans take it and would you take it? If the doctors tell us that we should take it, I'll be the first in line to take it, absolutely. But if Donald Trump tells us I should that we should take it, I'm not taking it. Stop playing politics with people's lives. The, the vice president earlier referred to, as part of what he thinks is an accomplishment, um, the, the president's trade war with China. You lost that trade war. You lost it. Lost the trade war with China. Joe Biden never fought it. Joe Biden has been a cheerleader for communist China through over the last several decades. So this debate came with coronavirus in the White House. Americans dying, the economy struggling, politics paralyzed. That is the present. Pence and Harris went on stage to offer their visions for the future. Susan Ormerson was watching it from Washington. So Susan. Well, Adrian, as you noted, the VP debate is not normally a must-see, but the 2020 campaign has been far from normal. And other than a referendum on Donald Trump, coronavirus is the leading issue in this election, and it led off tonight. Harris launched her attack. Whatever the vice president is claiming the administration has done, clearly it hasn't worked. When you're looking at over 210,000 dead bodies in our country, American lives, that have been lost, families that are grieving. Senator, I, I just ask you, stop playing politics with people's lives. The reality is that we will have a vaccine, we believe, before the end of this year. So Susan, compared to the you know, wild tone last week, what's your sense of what it was like tonight? Completely different. Uh, Pence even started off saying that it was an honor to be on stage with Senator Harris, and he praised her on her accomplishment being the first black and South Asian woman nominated to a presidential ticket. So it kind of went on like that. There were fewer interruptions, much more substance. Adrian, there's been so many extraordinary turns in the campaign just in the last few weeks, including the reporting on Donald Trump's personal income taxes, $750 a year, and that featured tonight. 
We now know Donald Trump owes and is in debt for $400 million. And just so everyone is clear, when, when we say in debt, it means you owe money to somebody. And the president said those public reports are not accurate. And, and the president's also released literally stacks of financial disclosures. So the months of, of protests that we've seen over racial justice and injustice, how did they deal with that tonight? Yeah, it came up law and order, of course, a key plank of the Trump campaign, and they've cast Joe Biden as soft on violence. So Harris stepped up on that one. Bad cops are bad for good cops. We need reform of our policing in America and our criminal justice system, which is why Joe and I will immediately ban chokeholds and carotid holes. Jo George Floyd would be alive today if we did that. There, there's no excuse for what happened to George Floyd. And justice will be served. But there's also no excuse for the rioting and looting that followed. Donald Trump is not here, of course, but he is in the audience at home tweeting his support, saying, Pence won big exclamation mark. Each had some strong moments, Adrian, with Biden in the lead. Part of Harris's job was to do no harm. And Pence's job, well, it was to steady the ship after a particularly raucous few weeks. And pundits are already saying that it was a pretty even night tonight, Adrian. All right, Susan Ormiston in Washington tonight. Thanks, Susan. Television debates are about perception as much as policy, projecting strength and confidence. For the presidential debate, we went to a pro-Trump Republican viewing party. Well, tonight, Stephen D'Souza is in the Democratic stronghold of Brooklyn, New York, where Democratic supporters shared their thoughts on how Kamala Harris performed. Stephen? Adrian, this is a crowd that was always going to be in favor of Kamala Harris. The question is, did she do enough to excite the base and hold Mike Pence accountable? I have Jordan and Scott here. What do you think of how Kamala Harris did tonight? Um, I think she did very well. She um, answered all the questions firmly, gracefully, with a lot of fact behind them. Um, and just calling uh, Pence out and, and, his admin and the Trump administration on how they've been handling the coronavirus situation. Yeah, absolutely agreed. I feel like she stood firm on, uh, she was a little shaky at the beginning, but once she got into a rhythm, uh, got into a rhythm of how the questions were being asked and how Pence's responses were, she just got better and better as she went along. How do you think she did? How do you think she handled herself? And in terms of just any moments that really stood out for you? Uh, I think uh, the best was there, were, there was a moment where uh, Pence had put out some information about uh, the coronavirus and about her record uh, as a prosecutor. And she made sure she reclaimed her time uh, and she made sure that she had as much time as he did uh, to question her, to respond. And she was very firm. She was very solid. She set the record straight, made sure all the facts were on the table. And I think it brought a good presence uh, to the people to make sure that she, you know, she she could handle her own. Do you think this will change people's minds? You know, not necessarily in this area, but you know, in other places in, in swing states where, where you know, there could be people on the fence. Possibly, you know, there's uh, been worry about um, what will happen uh, to Biden because he is going to he or Trump will be one of the oldest uh, presidents in office, and I think just her. Just being calm, cool, collected, answering all her and all the questions with authority will make makes her a bit of a stronger leader. But at the end of the day, I think just everyone should vote. So, that's yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think there was, uh, like she was saying, a lot of question. You know, she's wavered and waffled a little bit in some debates uh, going into this. Uh, once again, as she warmed up, she got better and better all the way through. And I think for anyone who kind of debated, God forbid, if something happened to Joe Biden, that she wouldn't be a strong leader. I think she uh, quashed all those uh, potential downfalls and, you know, has shown that she'll be a strong candidate. So thank you very much, Scott and Jordan. So that is a view here from Brooklyn, a very well-received debate and a strong performance from Kamala Harris. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen D'Souza at a Democratic watch party in Brooklyn tonight. CBC's presidential poll tracker showed the Biden-Harris ticket with a roughly 10-point lead in popular support heading into the debate, with a healthy projected lead in the Electoral College, too. Remember, though, Donald Trump beat his polls by more than 2% last time. 
To keep up with all the twists and the turns, including state-by-state -state breakdowns, go to cbcnews.ca slash U.S. Poll Tracker. Now, one note Mike Pence leaned into tonight, national security, and on that file, a win for the Trump administration today. Two infamous members of ISIS were brought to the U.S. for trial. U.K. citizens Alexander Koti and El Shafi El Sheikh were among a group known by captives in Syria as the Beatles for their British accents. They are accused of torturing hostages. Aid workers Kayla Mueller and Peter Kassig and journalists Stephen Sotloff and James Foley. All of them died in Syria, three of the four beheaded. Well, COVID-19 continues to spread in many parts of this country. But in Ontario and Quebec, a second wave is undeniable and increasingly deadly. Ontario now averages around 600 new cases a day. Quebec, another 1,000 per day. Numbers are leveling off a bit. Who knows for how long? But hospitalizations in those provinces have more than tripled over the past month. And while still far from the worst days of the spring, those provinces are reporting more deaths. But let's take you out east, where there's new concern the Atlantic bubble may not be as stable as hoped. An outbreak at a Moncton special care home has shot up from two cases to 19 in just one day. Here's Harry Forrestel on the frantic efforts to find the source. For a second day, public health staff have been scouring the Manoir Notre Dame for COVID-19. The sudden appearance of the virus at this special care home is still a mystery. This is an outbreak in a high vulnerability setting where there is a risk of transmission to the community. So we're looking at that as well. 17 new infections confirmed today. That's the highest one-day count in New Brunswick since the pandemic began. A number made shocking only by the province's success so far at keeping the virus at bay. This is definitely a wake-up call, one that we certainly didn't want to see, but one we were very concerned uh, might happen. Among those testing positive, 13 residents of the home, along with four workers and two family members, leaving those with loved ones at the manoir, including the leader of the province's opposition, on tenterhooks. Uh, I haven't spoken to my aunt, uh, but she does, she does live there in the uh, Manoir Notre Dame. She's been there for many years. We're hoping the best. Authorities are also warning about possible exposures at two local businesses, the Optical Centre at Moncton's Costco and a St. Hubert restaurant where one employee has already tested positive, raising concerns that the Atlantic bubble may have been breached. If there becomes a situation where there are cases in that area where the community spread, so where there's an unknown source for the infection, that's what community spread means, if that happens, then things have to change much more. For now, the most important task is finding the source of this outbreak and containing it, a job complicated by family gatherings for the Thanksgiving weekend. We cannot take chances. We understand that you want to spend your Thanksgiving surrounded by loved ones, but please, keep your gatherings small. And there may be other demands. Tomorrow, the Premier meets with his Cabinet COVID committee, including the leaders of the opposition, on the agenda, whether to make the wearing of masks mandatory in New Brunswick. Harry Forrestell, CBC News, Fredericton. Now, the vast majority of Canada's COVID-19 deaths are linked to long-term care. During the first wave, the country failed to protect some of its most vulnerable citizens. So Julie Ireton looks at whether they are any safer now as outbreaks at Ontario facilities multiply once again. Ottawa's West End Villa is one of 53 long-term care homes in the province with a COVID outbreak. 131 residents and staff members here have tested positive, including Peggy Hannon. Her daughter is in shock. I can't believe that this is happening again. Uh, if we learned anything from the first time around is, you know, this, this can blow up so fast. And why wasn't everything in place? We know what, what could happen. This spring, half of Ontario's long-term care homes had at least one case. Health advocates are concerned that measures to protect against a second wave aren't in place. A clear plan, systematic intervention, getting staff into the long-term care homes, it just hasn't happened. And so what we've seen in Ottawa in particular over the last month has just been astonishing and horrific. She cites the testing backlogs, continued housing of four residents per room, and understaffing as the biggest issues. And staff who are on the front lines are feeling the strain. We're dealing with a burnt out workforce that 
is they're going to make mistakes. The Ontario government says it's spending more than half a billion dollars to help homes hire workers, purchase equipment and prevent infections. We're working very hard to keep those numbers down and, uh, and so far it's of only a very small number of long-term care homes that have been affected. It's been horrible. It's been, it's been horrible. And my heart breaks. Over the past month, 19 residents have died at Ottawa's West End Villa Nursing Home. This family doesn't want others with loved ones in long-term care to face the same crisis. Julie Ireton, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, health officials in Toronto released new modelling today. With our level of transmission, we expect to see disease activity in the next few weeks of October that would exceed our April peak. The city's top doctor said if the virus is left unchecked, the number of infections could steadily get worse and reach yet another peak next spring. There were no specifics on what measures there should be now, but the city has urged the province to put restrictions on gyms and indoor dining. Still in Toronto, the country's largest school board will move nearly 600 teachers from in-person classes to virtual learning. That shuffle means some in-person classes will collapse and we're already a few weeks into the school year. The board said the restructuring was necessary to support more than 80,000 students who've signed up for online learning. In the Winnipeg area, new rules are in effect tonight at restaurants and bars, including early cutoff times for liquor and dine-in service and tougher physical distancing rules. Customers will also be asked to leave information for contact tracing. The new measures will be in place until at least October 26th. And a team from Quebec's Major Junior Hockey League suspended activities after 18 of its players and staff tested positive for COVID-19. The blainville boisbriand Armada is based near Montreal. The league started its regular season last Friday, the only of its kind in North America to play as scheduled in the fall. Well, Canadians have started to answer the call for arms, so to speak. Flu shots are rolling out across the country, but high demand and COVID-19 precautions could make getting that shot a challenge. And as Karen Pauls tells us, it's also a rehearsal for how things might go when that other vaccine arrives. How are you feeling today? Excellent. Lucy Roberts came to get her seasonal flu shot the first day she could. Any line of defense is going to help. Um, and certainly I don't want two viruses at the same time. Getting a flu shot in the time of COVID looks different. People going to pharmacies may see staff in full PPE. You have to fill out a contact tracing form before you go in, and after the shot, the room is disinfected. Despite that, demand for appointments is still high. This pharmacist says he's stocked up. Uh, I've already got here probably about 300, 350 doses already, so that, that should keep us going, and then we'll get an auto replenishment of doses as we move along. But some pharmacists were already running out of vaccine halfway through the day. For the patients, they, we just had to kind of tell them, OK, come next week, like not today. In normal times, the Ontario Medical Association says 55% of vaccinations are administered by doctors, 40% by pharmacists. This year, that number could be reversed. What needs to happen this year with COVID is a lot more space between people and a lot more time between people. There needs to be time to clean and to sanitize. And frankly, most of our community health care isn't set up that way. On top of demand and those COVID precautions, some pharmacies are offering both flu shots and COVID tests. In Atlantic Canada, where the flu vaccine has been available for a week already, there have been some innovative ways of getting needles into arms, like this drive through clinic. All of this, an important dry run for a possible COVID-19 vaccine. So that when we do get that COVID vaccine, hopefully sooner rather than later, we don't have to learn all the same mistakes over again. And for now, a flu shot is the best prevention to avoid the so-called twindemic of influenza and COVID-19. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Nova Scotia's police watchdog has charged a Halifax officer with assault in connection to the arrest of a black 15-year-old in February. I can, go out, I can go outside if I want to. The charges relate to this incident outside a mall in Bedford. Two police officers can be seen approaching the teen and telling him he's under arrest. Then there's a scuffle. His mother shared photos of injuries she said he sustained during the incident. 
The officer is set to appear in court next month. Well, your takeout bag is going to look a little different next year. The federal government is moving forward on a key election promise. It will ban single-use plastics by the end of 2021. Well, today the environment minister revealed the first six items heading for the exit. Salima Shibji has the details. For Donna Chevrier, running a small restaurant is beyond stressful these days. Figuring out the switch to take out with all that packaging and now deciding how to replace this plastic. It's really costly. Like a bag, a paper bag for just like this size cost me approximately 50 cents. That's definitely added to the bottom line. That's right now the bottom line is, you know, disappearing by the day. Today, the Liberal government announced the six single-use plastics it plans to ban outright. Plastics that are hard to recycle with known alternatives. Grocery bags, straws, stir sticks, cutlery, six-pack rings, and some takeout containers. All carefully chosen, says the minister. We've been very sensitive to trying to ensure that this can be done in a very much affordable way for all businesses. <laughs> He's also sensitive to the fact that a ban on plastics, while popular with Canadians, is not quite as popular in a pandemic. Wilkinson says most people won't notice the ban much, that the Liberals plan to do more to tackle the 3 million tonnes of plastic waste Canadians throw away every year. If you toad up the number of plastic products that we use uh, in our lives, the ban is probably a fraction of 1% of the product. Canada's recycling rate is a dismal 9%, which is why some environmentalists would like to see more action, especially now. The estimates I see are that single-use plastic use has increased about 250 to 300% since the pandemic began. But Alberta is less than keen. The province struggling with an oil slump wants to produce and recycle more plastic, not less. Ottawa, they have to approach everything as in do no harm. Don't damage us any further. Don't harm any further jobs in Alberta. The government is moving ahead, but this ban won't be a reality before the end of next year, leaving everyone time to adjust. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Of course, there is plenty more to dig into on the debate tonight. We'll take a look at some of the key moments. Plus, our U.S. political panel is here to weigh in. And Facebook hits delete on QAnon conspiracy theorists. But is it too little too late? It's the start of a process of radicalization. For many of those people, that leads to really, really dark and often violent places. A young hockey player makes history, and he's hoping to change the sport, too. Spread uh, awareness, um, you know, and uh, hopefully be a motivation to younger kids. And, um, you know, that's, I think that, that's a big responsibility to take on. We're back in two minutes. Facebook is cracking down on QAnon. Pages, groups, and Instagram accounts peddling the conspiracy theory are being mass deleted today, years after the social network promised to do so. And as Thomas Daigle tells us, the crackdown includes pages based in Canada. From anti-mask demonstrations in Quebec to Donald Trump's supporters outside his hospital, one potent symbol keeps showing up. That letter Q, the unmistakable sign of people drawn into QAnon, the collection of unfounded conspiracy theories now banned by Facebook. It's a fairly wide ranging phenomenon that's going to be a real challenge to, uh, you know, sort of to eradicate. On va parler, uh, un peu de Donald Trump. Caught up in the purge, one of QAnon's biggest Facebook, boosters uh, in Quebec, uh, a conspiracy uh, theorist uh, with uh, tens of uh, thousands uh, of uh, online uh, followers. His Facebook pages now taken down. And those people saying that it's not true that we have a virus, of course it doesn't help uh, to convince population to follow our guidelines. Yes, QAnon supporters frequently spread COVID misinformation, but they also believe a twisted, often anti-Semitic series of fabrications involving Trump taking on a secret network of child traffickers. I understand they like me very much. It's the start of a process of radicalization. For many of those people, that leads to really, really dark and often violent places. Remember in July when an armed man barged onto the grounds of Rideau Hall? Well, the accused had posted QAnon content. 
And this week, the Saskatchewan party scrambled once a candidate resigned after engaging with conspiracy theorists. Say that these are not uh, policies or directions that the Saskatchewan party government supports. Major retail sites are still selling QAnon t-shirts and merchandise, signaling a Facebook ban may be just a minor setback. If they're going to recruit new folks or they're going to reach new audiences, they have to be in these more public places. And so they are highly incentivized to regroup. Dangerous and disproven, the conspiracies won't yet disappear. Thomas Dagg to CBC News, Toronto. Well, making the big leagues is no small accomplishment. We will meet a newly minted NHLer who is making history. What Quentin Byfield hopes to do with his newfound fame. But before that, more in our top story, our U.S. political panel takes a look at key moments in the vice presidential debate. It has been less than a week since we first learned about President Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis. And since then, more than a dozen cases have been linked to the White House. Trump was hospitalized and then discharged, all the while Americans continue to vote. This week was a roller coaster. One word would be disastrous. Chaos and limitless irresponsibility. It's under these unprecedented circumstances that both camps meet again. Tonight, it's Mike Pence versus Kamala Harris in a vice presidential debate like no other. We have all been thinking about the possibility that a vice president might have to step in. Understanding who is going to be a heartbeat away from the presidency matters. This vice presidential debate is almost certainly a preview of what's coming up in 2024. And so let's bring in our U.S. political panel. Republican and Trump supporter Daniel McCarthy is the editor of Modern Age Journal. Danielle Moody is the host of the podcast Woke AF Daily and co-host of the podcast Democracy-ish. And Yasha Munk is a contributing editor at The Atlantic and associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. So thank you all for being here tonight. This debate, as we all know, almost didn't happen. Uh, it was historic, all sorts of strict precautions. Last week, a bit chaotic, to say the least. So I'm curious what your first impressions are of how this all played out. Let's start with you, Yasha. Uh, well, first of all, I think the debate uh, is much more substantial than the one that we suffered through last week. Um, there is a real exchange of ideas. The candidates have been able to actually go in depth on some of the uh, questions without the continual interruption and hack trend that we saw uh, last week. Um, I think substantively, um, you know, both sides try to hit some points against each other, uh, but ultimately this looks to me as though it's going to be a draw in the eyes of the public, which is to say that uh, people who are going to vote for Joe Biden before today are going to continue to vote for Joe Biden, people who are going to vote for Donald Trump uh, before today are going to continue to vote for Donald Trump. And given that Joe Biden has been uh, quite far ahead in the opinion polls, that's probably in the interest of the Biden campaign. Any debate night, any night of a week in which there isn't a real change of narrative is probably in the interest of the Biden campaign. Um, and that's what happened tonight. OK, interesting point. So, so Daniel, do you think there was a change of narrative tonight? I think there was, in the sense that uh, Mike Pence gave a very, you know, sort of strong, bold, unyielding, but also civil approach to the Donald Trump agenda. And the fact that people can look at uh, what Mike Pence said tonight and say, you know, this is a very reasonable account that's been offered for re-electing uh, President Trump and uh, Vice President Bi uh, Vice President uh, Pence, rather. This, uh, I think, uh, is a big change in the narrative from what we saw last week, where Donald Trump was uh, so over the top in his uh, aggressiveness that I think a lot of, uh, you know, people wavering uh, were left feeling as if uh, Donald Trump should be out of the question. So, Danielle, uh, just listening to what Yasha was starting saying, that, that this was a draw, I, I, I get the feeling you don't think it was a draw. No, I don't. But I, you know, would actually agree with Daniel that, you know, what's very interesting about Mike Pence is that he's able to lie with impunity. He's able to lie and make it seem, you know, easy and soft and something that, you know, you could take in, as opposed to Donald Trump, who wants to beat you over the head with the same lies. I think what is astonishing to me, though, is the differences between these two camps, between the Biden camp and the Trump camp. You have one that is very interested 
in saving American lives, you have another one that is very indifferent to American lives. You have one that is very interested in embracing dictators. You have another that is, wants to rebuild our relationships with our allies. I do agree with Yasha that we saw points and policies that we did not get to see in the first presidential debate that I think were very important here because the American people need to see that they have a clear choice and that there is a very clear difference between these two campaigns. Uh, one thing that was interesting tonight is that the pandemic was like a huge part of this debate. So I think we're going to play a clip here. This is some of what Mike Pence said to Kamala Harris about it. The fact that you continue to undermine public confidence in a vaccine, exactly. if the vaccine emerges during the Trump administration, I think is, is unconscionable. And Senator, I, I just ask you, stop playing politics with people's lives. Daniel, what went through you when you heard him say that? Good move, not a good move? Sorry, which of us? Uh, so I, this is the problem with Daniel and Danielle, but, but uh, Daniel McCarthy. Uh, it's a very important question, because if Donald Trump wins re-election, you almost certainly will have a vaccine released during his administration. And at that point, uh, what is Kamala Harris going to say? What is Joe Biden going to say? What are Democrats and progressives in general going to say? Are they going to accept a vaccine that comes out that is to the credit of Donald Trump and his administration? As Mike Pence mentioned uh, during tonight's debate, for the past four years, Democrats have basically tried to delegitimize the results of the 2016 election. If they try to do the same thing in 2020 and in going forward, you might very well see an anti-vaxxer movement on the left. Danielle, when we spoke last time, you really wanted to hear more about COVID. And, uh, and I'm wondering to what degree you were satisfied or unsatisfied with what you heard about it this week. I think that it was right to be front and center. And I think that Kamala Harris's points with regard to whether or not she would take a vaccine that Donald Trump wants to give the stamp of approval on. This is the man that told us to shoot bleach into our arms and told us to take hydrochloroquine, which is from one of his donors. Um, so, yes, I uh, uh, say to the fact that unless independent doctors were to come out and verify that a vaccine was safe for all people and that was actually going to work and that it wasn't coming from a Trump factory or a Trump donor, I wouldn't take it either. And so I appreciated Kamala Harris's transparency and honesty around that because many of Americans are feeling the same exact way. And I think that it's important that we continue to talk about COVID because it is not behind us. It is not something that has happened and it's over. It's not something that we can reflect on because we're still in the midst of it. Yasha, I, I think a lot of conventional wisdom about a VP debate is dollars to donuts come election day. No one's going to remember it at all, that it's not going to matter. But do you think in these, in these odd times that this one actually matters and that anyone was actually convinced? No, I think this debate will end up not mattering. And that's why I have to disagree with Daniel, I can see the argument that if a Republican Party was represented by Mike Pence, if he was at the top of the ticket, uh, the fate of a Republican Party in this upcoming election might look quite different. I do think that Mike Pence is much shrewder and more effective at delivering a conservative point of view in a way that might be acceptable to the U.S. population. But we all know that Donald Trump eats up all of the oxygen in the political system, that this election is going to be a referendum on Donald Trump, not on Mike Pence. And so the fact that I think Mike Pence has fared uh, relatively better compared to Kamala Harris, compared to how um, Donald Trump did uh, last week, compared to Joe Biden, is not going to be of lasting significance. Because however reasonable Mike Pence may come across, I'm not sure he actually is reasonable, but however reasonable he manages to come across, people know that it's not Mike Pence calling the shots, it's Donald Trump. Uh, and he appears a lot less reasonable. Okay, let's play another clip now, this one of Kamala Harris. And, you know, it's interesting to watch. Uh, she spent a lot of time addressing the camera this time, just like Joe Biden. Mike Pence started to do it towards the end of the debate. But let's have a look at the style and the substance from Kamala Harris tonight. It's in America, Susan. you deserve better. Joe Biden will be a president who brings our country together. Senator Harris. And, and, and recognizes the beauty in our diversity and the fact Senator that we all Harris, have so you. much more in common than what separates us. So, Danielle, uh, briefly here, you know, not just uh, on the tone, but on the substance, did she go where you wanted her to go, or were you hoping for something different? 
No, I am very proud of Kamala Harris's performance tonight. And I think that taking the cue from Joe Biden of speaking directly to the American people is inc is important. Um, and I think that it matters a lot because addressing Mike Pence, and again, it was the same thing that I had said on Twitter about uh, the first uh, presidential debate, trying to fact check them in real time uh, is is not going to work. Uh, it, it's not going to work because the rate that they lie is like nothing we've ever seen. So talking directly to the American people, giving them the facts, talking about your policy, what you can do for them, looking into their eyes, that matters and it's effective. So last word to you, uh, Daniel. Mike Pence is so calm. He's so cool. He had a fly on his head for a lot of this debate, didn't even notice it. But, but what do you think got under his skin tonight? I think what got under his skin the most, obviously, were the attacks on Donald Trump's attitudes towards the United States military. And as Mike Pence said, he has himself a uh, family within the military, including a son. And, uh, you know, Mike Pence took that as a personal uh, insult. And I think, uh, quite rightly, a lot of Americans took that as an insult to the commander in chief and to uh, our armed forces as well. All right. Daniel McCarthy, Danielle Moody, and Yasha Monk, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, Hurricane Delta has slammed into Mexico's east coast. We're going to look at where the storm is going next and why it's expected to get stronger before it gets there. Plus, the growing fury in India after a horrific rape and murder. Well, Hurricane Delta made landfall in Mexico early this morning, just south of Cancun. The Category 2 storm lashed the region with high winds and heavy rains. Power was lost in big swaths of the Mexican coast, but there were no immediate reports of deaths or injuries. The storm is now headed into the Gulf of Mexico, where it is expected to gain strength before reaching the U.S. sometime on Friday. Belarus opposition leader Svetlana Tikhonovskaya has been placed on Russia's wanted list, according to an interior ministry database. She is wanted on a criminal charge, but it's unclear what that charge is. The former presidential candidate fled Belarus after she lost the August election, which was widely seen as fraudulent. Well, there is widespread outrage in India over the death of a 19-year-old woman who was allegedly violently gang-raped by four men and died in hospital last week. Rene Filipponi takes us through the anger that has gripped the country. A cremation in the middle of the night, seen as one more indignity against the 19-year-old victim. For the people in her community, there is anger. They say her family never agreed to it and never got to say goodbye. They mourn the teenager who was allegedly gang-raped and spent weeks in the hospital before dying. Her mother, who found her unconscious, has been saying the attackers should be hanged. The calls for justice have led to clashes with police who are being accused of a cover-up. The head of police in Uttar Pradesh state, where the attack happened, say the evidence collected doesn't support accusations of rape. He says people are using this case to stir up tensions. People are upset, and people are upset because this has been a problem that has existed for way too long. Manakshi Gangali is with Human Rights Watch in India and says the outrage is intensified by the fact the victim is a member of the Dalit caste, formerly known as the Untouchables and often victims of violence. The four men arrested are of a higher caste. Women and girls in India need to feel safer, they need to get justice, and certainly women from vulnerable communities, whether it's caste or religion minorities, they, need, they particularly need the protection of the state, and we are not seeing enough of that. The 2012 gang rape of a woman on a bus in New Delhi sparked mass protests and led to tougher laws. But India is still one of the most dangerous places for women, with a rape occurring every 15 minutes. Tonight, despite promises from the government to take action, protests continue across the country, fueled every day by new reports. Yet another girl or woman has been attacked. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Quinton Byfield hasn't stepped onto the ice yet, but he is already making history. Up next, what he sees as his big responsibility in the NHL. I'm Josh Block. 
Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, a full wrap on why the vice presidential debate is one of the most consequential in recent history. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Well, he hasn't even played his first NHL game, but Quinton Byfield has already made league history as its highest drafted black player. The 18-year-old was picked second overall last night by the Los Angeles Kings. Back to Gabriel Salasa looks at what it means to him and the sport. Bring on the celebrations. Hockey history has been made. I'm just very excited. I'm, you know, just ecstatic to go to L.A. With pride, Quinton Byfield wears his new jersey and his new position as the highest drafted black player in the NHL. Um, you know, moving on in the future, um, just to spread uh, awareness, um, you know, and uh, hopefully be a motivation to younger kids. You want them tighter? Just let me know. Cool. Moise and Hashem is yeah. thinking of the future too. I think it's incredibly powerful when you have a sport where the players are 95% white. And now you have Quinton, who's been drafted number two overall. Byfield's historic achievement is especially poignant during this time of reckoning on race. The league paused gameplay a day after other major leagues, after players pushed for it. <laughs> You're ready. Hashem, who is also with the NHL's Youth Hockey Inclusion Committee, says the league is making improvements. The percentage of um, people of color that are working in the league offices is around 14%. It can be a lot higher. Things are changing and there are efforts being made to make sure that the game is open. 16-year-old Brittany Morrison was always open to the game. The very first day that I went on the ice, I was like, I'm not trying to fall. She came to Canada from Jamaica in 2017 and was introduced to hockey by a coach Hearing about Byfield today. When I see somebody that looks like me or face the same challenges that I do in society, I feel that that's a win for everybody. Um, we're trying to be more inclusive and more mindful of the choices um, that we make. So I feel like this is definitely a step in, in the right direction. Byfield hopes many more will follow him. As for what's ahead of him. Hopefully get the opportunity to hoist the Stanley Cup. Magda Gebrasalasis, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so no shortage of emotional moments at the draft. When the San Jose Sharks selected Calgary's Ozzy Weisblad, they did it with a signal to his mother. The San Jose Sharks are proud to select from the Prince Albert Raiders, Ozzy Weisblad. So Ozzy's mother, Kim White, who is deaf, certainly got the message. She called the use of sign language a nice gesture. As you can see, his family really appreciated it. Okay, next on The National, why a package of Newfoundland onion seeds was banned from advertising on Facebook. Next, in our moment. When you see this picture of onions, you probably, hopefully, just see onions. But a Facebook algorithm saw something completely different. A seed company in Newfoundland was trying to post an online advertisement, but it did not go exactly like they planned. It is our moment. We've been working on digitizing our business with coronavirus and everything. So with that, we also want to sell through Facebook. We boost posts and pay Facebook money to get more reach. And we tried to do that with all of our vegetable seed packs, but um, one of them came back with an error. Turned out um, these onions were overly sexual, overtly sexual, they said. I think it's the, the two round shapes next to each other that uh, the, the algorithm, I don't think it was a human that made this mistake. I think the Facebook algorithm thought it was um, nudity. A pretty wholesome business. We've been <laughs> selling gardening supplies for the last almost 100 years. We've gotten so many people from all across Canada reach out saying how funny it was and we've had people order, a lot of people are ordering that, that onion from our website right now. If it had been um, approved in the first place, we probably wouldn't have gotten nearly as much reach out of it. The, the sexy onions, they've gotten a bit of a, a reputation now. <laughs> sexy, sexy onions. onions. I, I gotta say, I don't see it. Yeah, yeah uh, and, and yet somehow you can't unsee it. I, I guess. <laughs> uh, so he said that this has worked out actually really well for them, that they are selling seeds all across <laughs> the country. And, and a lot of Canadians are saying, I had no idea that company even existed in Newfoundland. So, you know, it worked out. 
never see onions the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> Seared into my mouth. That's The National for this October 7th. Have a great night. Good night.